Hello, and welcome again to our latest SB Talks podcast. Today is Thursday, April 21st, and I'm once again joined by our Chief Investment Officer, Ashley Owen. Uh, welcome, Ashley. Morning, uh, evening, good afternoon, afternoon, morning, good night, wherever you are in the world. Great to see you. Now, Ashley, um, not surprisingly, the, the last few weeks has continued the theme of uh, market obsession with interest rates and inflation in particular. And while the Fed made its move uh, in March in terms of raising rates, the RBA has been a little bit more cagey, but the release of the April minutes um, from the RBA's meeting started to give us a little bit more of a feel for where they're leaning to. And particularly, they are now expecting that inflation will break the top end of their um, three per, two, to, 2 to 3% target band when the numbers come out for Q1 in about a week's time. And I guess that means interest rates are probably going to start to happen sooner than we otherwise anticipate in Australia, which is, I guess, what the markets have been expecting for a long time, but the RBA is just a little bit late to its own party. Yes, we've been having a go at the RBA for the last couple of years now. They, uh, we're all trying to figure out what's going through Philip Lowe's mind, uh, and we, we've, we've got some good insights uh, into how the RBA thinks. We've got Don Stammer on our committee, who was RBA, and who hired the last four RBA governors uh, when he was in the RBA. And we've got Ian McFarlane, who's uh, an RBA governor, um, two governors ago, who's very much involved with discussion and talking in the current forums um, around the world and in Australia. So it's one of those funny things. The, um, the money markets have been pricing in um, two or three or four rate hikes in Australia during 2022. Um, which we're now sort of well into, but the RBA tried to peg rates at 0.1%. Mm. So they tried to say, well, we won't touch rates for three years. Um, we'll first start to raise rates in the second half of 2024, which is still years away yet. And um, Jerome Powell at the Fed um, had a similar uh, promise, uh, a set of promises over many, many months and many, many meetings during 2020 saying that we're not going to touch rates for years and years. Um, Powell did a mere culprit and said, got it wrong, forget that phrase, transitory, it's out, we now have to attack inflation. He, he, he did that without without losing face. So, Phil Lowe at the RBA hasn't yet figured out the formal words to not look too silly when he says that's all off. So well, in, um, in their last set of minutes, is that their attempt to do it? I think what were the words that they used? I think brought forward the, the expectation on inflation has brought forward the likely timing of rate increases. That's obviously that's fairly right. broad in general, but I feel like that's them trying to gradually reset their position. Yes, he's dropped the word patient for he's no longer patient, which means he, is he impatient or is he just not patient? Who knows? Um, so the point is that um, the inflation around the world and in Australia, in pretty much all countries, has run off the rails. Um, most of it's supply constraints, which is not really demand inflation. So it's not inflation that you attack with rate, rate hikes. But in underlying inflation, um, if you look at the uh, you know, US is above 8% and underlying is sort of 5 or 6 In Australia, it's above 3 3.5%, and the underlying is 3-ish. Um, then you've got the volatile items and food and fuel and all those sort of things. But things like rents are going up, cost of thing, everything is going up because transport cost is going up and fuel cost is going up and everyone's paying more for pretty much everything. I was in the supermarket the other day and you know, something you buy regularly for $4 now costs $6. So you only buy one of them instead of two or three. Um, so that's, that's affecting prices and that's affecting people's ability to pay for other things and spend money and go out and do things. So um so inflation is running at a rate in australia that they have to start raising rates and they've said probably they'll start raising rates given it's you know 0.1 percent they'll start raising rates middle of this year uh and you'll probably see now i've always said this and people will be bored hearing me central bankers almost always are asleep at the wheel and act too late and then too heavy when they have to go too late they always they wake up in a stupor and say, "Oh, we're going to do something." Attack rate, so they pull, do this pull up the, the handbrake. So the the only thing that the only time that didn't work is 1994 when Greenspan got up one day in January and said, "Let's hike rates nine times," and he went mad and the bond markets collapsed and there were hedge fund collapses and council governments collapsed all over the world because of that bond crisis. So that's the only time that the Fed went early too hard and they've never done it 
uh, almost never done it before and never done it since. So Jerome Powell at the Fed has been very careful to say, we're going to be slow and careful. But now quite a few other Fed um, bosses around, there's 12 Feds in the US, it's not just one, there's 12 different Federal, federal Reserve banks in, in America for the 12 different regional economies in America. Quite a few of those, and also the um, even the vice chair, Lael Brainard, who was appointed this year, we're still waiting for confirmation, but she's now the, the vice chair and the next chairman after Powell, most likely. She's a notorious um, pro-inflation dove uh, versus a hawk. So she's very keen on seeing inflation, seeing wage growth and seeing prices grow. She's the last person you expect to come out and say, we've got to attack inflation hard. And she did that last week. So. It's looking like, as, a, as usual, decade after decade, central banks, including Australia, including the US, if you look at risks to markets, the number one risk to markets is going to be a sudden aggressive rate hikes where that wasn't expected. So the, think, markets, the markets are now, and, and we've talked about this on some of the, the podcasts, the markets have been pricing in significant rate hikes correct. Um, long before the RBA had talked about it. In the US, as you rightly point out, it's a slightly different situation. They've been trying to telegraph it more to the markets and almost then meet the market, you know, market, yes. but market expectations in Australia are now following the minutes, pushing certainly north of one and a half percent, probably closer to two percent towards the end of the year being the rate. Uh, the state yes. potentially more than that. Yes, the um, you look at, say, the three year bond yield, which is a fair or it's a fair guide as to the market expectations of cash rates in three years plus a bit of a maturity premium, we'll ignore that. Um, so that's been running at above, you know, two-ish percent for a while. So you look at the one-year rates well above one heading for two, which means in a year's time, people are expecting cash rates to be one percent, one and a half, two percent. So in Australia, we've got a different structure to the US. US inflation is running at six, seven, eight percent, which is, which is you know, 50 year highs. It's quite scary. The last time we had that was when Volcker had to raise rates to 18 percent to kill inflation in the early 80s. So, this what, is what, what is your opinion around that? Just how hard will that, you know, how much of that is, is due to supply constraints and other things? And a lot of it's now just baked in inflation. That's going to be very hard to shift. Yes. The, um, the, so the big question I get all the time is, when will rates start to rise? And the answer will be, you know, in the US now. But the next question is how quickly they might rise and where will they sit? Uh, where will they settle? And the answer to the last question first is nothing ever settles. Uh, like all things in life, there's no sort of fair equilibrium, which the textbooks say there is. Things just wildly swing above and below that. You know, share prices, bond prices, interest rates, currencies, they, they swing around wildly based on sentiment. There's no, there's no point that, that, that settles and it sort of stays there. Um, so one of the great um, things you see in the paper all the time is, oh, this time it's uncertain, as if there was any certain time in the past. People look back at these straight lines and say, well, let, let's settle at a price. So when will the, where will the RBA rate hike settle? And the answer is it'll never settle. It'll always just swing wildly. So it will, um, the other question then becomes, well, where, where do you think rates might rise so they might stop for a while and pause and then fall? Um, it all depends on how aggressive the rate hikes are, and the US is still the key that drives world markets. For example, if we have a uh, three or four or five rate hikes this year in the US, um, that will crunch spending. Uh, bond yields, most American households have a mortgage based on 30 year bond yields, and they've always, they've already ridden quite rapidly over the last couple of there are years. 30 year so, mortgage price is already priced in a fair bit. That's right. So in Australia, most people have a floating rate mortgage. So that's directly tied to the bill yields, which is the cash rate effectively. So if rates rise from zero to say 3% in a couple of years, then people's mortgages will rise from two or 3% to six or 7% very quickly in, in the space of a couple of years. That's scary for a lot of people with a lot of debt. In America, you've had a, their, their mortgage, almost all of their mortgages are based on fixed rates, based on long-term bond yields. And that's been rising very gradually over the last three years, two years from middle of 2020 onwards. So that's much less increase in pain to American households than is for Australia. It's a mm. much higher, more volatile household spending hit uh, rate hikes in Australia. So it's quite different. 
plus the levels of debt in Australian households, mortgage debt, I household, should say. Are. Household debt in Australia, relative to income, relative to assets, relative to everything, relative to total economic pie, is far, far higher than it is in America. America had a massive clean out in the middle of the 2000s with the GFC. Australia sailed through that and just geared up on household debt since then. So it's a bit different. So we're more, vo more volatile and more vulnerable to rate hikes than America for a few reasons. Um, so the getting back to the point is that if those rate hikes do crunch spending and crunch economic output and jobs uh, around the world, particularly in Europe, you look at Europe, Europe, Europe's going through a massive energy crisis. Everyone's paying two or three times they did last year for all sorts of things in the household, including energy and heating. So that's a little alone switching off Russian gas, which is another thing that they're pondering. So that's going most likely going to tip Europe back into recession an economic recession, which has got implications for jobs and incomes. Mm. Um, so I can see um, inflation and growth slowing rapidly in Europe. I can see the same thing happening in Japan, which is still flatlining from 30 years ago, almost. It's got a very, it's got a very weak yen, which is helping J Japanese exports and jobs, which is a good thing for Japan. So if you've got Europe, and China slowing because their lockdowns, their property collapse, their construction collapse, their general slowdown in China anyway. So I can see that slowing global demand. I can see Europe slowing because of the European. And you're going to have you're going to have quantitative tightening over the top of this as well. So we've had this decade of quantitative easing, and I think the only year in the last eight or nine where the balance sheet of the U.S. central bank hadn't expanded was 2018, when yes, the market tried to kill it. Reacted. Um, yeah. We're about to see that reverse come over the top yes. of everything else. Yeah, so that, um, that, that, that has more implications for, for US because that affects, uh, as, as the Fed sells off government bonds, that it's, it's $9 trillion of balance sheet that it's got, mm. as it sells off some of those, that will also increase bond yields, which will push up mortgage rates in America. It won't do the same in Australia, but it'll push up mortgage rates in America. So that will it'll increase the tightening of the belts in American households. So getting back to the question of rates are rising, Hmm. How far will they rise before they pause and perhaps stop? I can see that China will slow, Europe will certainly slow, possibly America will slow. So when they see slowing of activity, they'll say, right, as they did in the end of 2018, they'll say, right, that's, that's enough. We need to pause rate hikes. We can't attack that anymore because it's now costing jobs. So I can see quite a stop start affair. I can't just see rates going from zero to 5% in a straight line. I can see it's going, to be, it's going to be a delicate dance when we've had yeah. 10 yeah. years plus of this ultra accommodative monetary policy that the exit yep. from it's never going to be a simple straight line to a new, 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 new normal. Uh, and then yeah. ready as we go. Uh, That's right. So in the, all of this is interesting, but the rubber hits a road when you say, well, what shares do I buy? Do I sell mm. shares? Do I buy property? Do I bond? What do I do with my money? What assets do you own in this environment? Through, through all of those, um, uh, uh, potholes we're going to hit over the next two or three or four years. We invest in companies and companies have to look through those. Now, inflation, interest rates, politics, who's in power, it doesn't really affect long-term outlook for companies. Apple is going to thrive regardless whether or not Biden's in power or Trump's in power. Same with Microsoft, Google, Facebook. So companies, BHP, CSL, companies will have to, as they always have done, navigate all these things. So when we invest in companies and stocks and markets, we think about those sort of things. We don't think about where rates are going to go to because it's interesting, but not really relevant for which companies do you buy. And I guess when we're talking companies, it's an interesting in the US, we're going through the latest sort of round of reporting from, from a number of companies. And it's very, a lot of fixation on the numbers, not just the, the profit numbers, but the forecast of what's happening during the quarter that we're in in the next quarter because of the lockdown that's happened again in China. Uh, with their ultra, well, the world touch wood begins to move on from the pandemic. China's very much still in the hard lockdown camp, and that's really affecting supply and, and has a huge flow through for many international companies. Yes, the um, reliance on China is something that's affecting a lot of companies, uh, particularly in Australia with mining revenues from China and, and food and coal and all sorts of things. One of the, uh, we got, a, we got a, a wake up call in 2018 when Trump started his trade war and China and then ScoMo backed Trump openly and um, became the front man for attacking China, rightly or wrongly. The good part about that was when China cracked down on pretty much all imports from, from Australia, except iron ore, 
and coking coal. Uh, everything else was basically chopped off, you know, food, all sorts of agricultural products, uh, thermal coal, they were all cut off. The good thing about that was Australian exporters uh, woke up to themselves and said, we're going to export to other people. So they started opening discussions with India and Taiwan and Korea and all sorts of Indonesia, Philippines. So the that wake up call, the trade war in 2018 or starting in 2018 was actually very good because exporters got off their bikes and actually started, got on their bikes and started opening up export markets. Diversifying their export markets. Yeah. So because of that, even though we've had this massive crackdown of everything, including now iron ore from China, um, exporting revenues to Australian companies is extraordinarily good and off the charts. So, and every time we look at the numbers, the export numbers assumed for Australia, they're always exceeded. And the uh, you look at the dividend yields from uh, you know the big three miners in Australia, iron ore miners, they're trading on you know double digit dividend yields on the assumption they will fall. Well, they haven't fallen mm -hmm. yet. Um, so that's a good thing. And the same thing with um, with Europe and reliance on Russian gas and coal and oil. Um, they've got to get through winter, which is a few months yet. You know, we're coming out of winter now in the Northern Hemisphere. So they've got summer, they've got, to, they're, they're buying, the summer will buy them time to get out of reliance. Now, it's all very well to say that we'll go, they'll go and buy gas elsewhere. You've got to build pipelines and you've got to ship gas, which, which takes a lot of time to set up and plan, but they've got another year to do that. Um, so the, the, these shocks and wake up calls are actually not bad to get people to think about other sources of supply, even if it takes a year or two to build. It's good that it's happening now. So when China's slowed down and stopped, what, one of the things with China is that they're going through a natural slow, a cyclical slowdown with their property collapse anyway, which is slow for exports. Not It hasn't slowed exports of iron ore. They're still importing around at just under a billion dollars of iron ore and also coking coal from Australia. Uh, Pilbara iron ore miners are still shipping 950 million tonnes, which is nearly an air's rock full of rock to China, despite the lockdowns, despite the, um, the problems. So that's still going on. China's slowing cyclically. It's also having these massive, I mean, China, for some unknown reason, decided to not vaccinate. They're using two or three subpar vaccinations. They're not vaccinating the old, so they're, they're relying on the lockdowns and the zero policy, which hasn't worked anywhere else in the world, hasn't worked in China. That's also slowing activity and demand and construction and jobs. Um, it's also, that's not the big one. I think the big one is, uh, which is a real risk to a lot of exporters, including Australian exporters, the big one is going to be China back Russia. Mm. India, by the way, back Russia. India can't say no to Russia because India relies on Russia for a whole lot of things, including all of their defence. So India is a, is a Russia backer. If China, the big one's going to be if China does something openly to further back Russia and you know, let alone take Taiwan, which I think is off the table for a while because of what Putin's done. The big one's going to be if the world and in Australia says, let's cut off China. So go like with sanctions to China. Russia. That's going to be a big one. That takes out a third. It's going to really, that would really test everybody's uh, appetite right. for uh, sanctions. So Russia's tiny. Russia, Russia's a tiny bit, the yeah. same size as Australia economy. It's a tiny thing. No one cares if it comes or goes, but it's the sanctions which are affecting Europe. Mm. China is not. China's a massive player. It's, it's not the number one or two, depending on how you measure it, economy in the world. Mm. So if you, if you take out China with sanctions and, and border walls and simply cut off China like they've cut off Russia, that's the big one. I don't think it'll happen. But that's the fear that will affect... Um, I'd, I'd always look at that and say, look how hesitant or reluctant they've been to do hard sanctions against Russian gas and oil supply. That's right. They've gone after That's all right. sorts of other things, but their dependency on the oil and gas has meant that the UK, I think, had made a commitment to be Russian oil free by the end of 2022. So yeah. people, people so, keep a fair degree of self-interest in these things. That's right. So if you look at, if you, Europe's in a hard spot, mm. they have given one and a half billion dollars of support to Ukraine in the last two months. At the same two months, they've paid $32 billion cash to Russia to buy oil and gas. Mm. So they're saying, well, we don't like what you're doing, but here's $32 billion for your effort. Go and use this money to buy tanks. So they can't really pull the pin. Now, that's a good, that's a wake, That's our wake-up call in 2018. Get out of China, stop reliance on China. So they've said, well, we've, 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 Europe's made a bad strategic move over the last 10 years. Merkel's largely to blame for that. She's very pro-Russia. You look at so Gerhard Schroeder, who's Merkel's boss and mentor, 
Schroeder's on the board of Gazprom, who's the Russian gas gov government company. So the ties that, that, that Germany found itself in to Russia have come back to bite them. We've got new leadership all over Europe, probably in France next month. So they're now unwinding rapidly the reliance on Russia, which is good. You can't be reliant on, on one party, which is a belligerent party for too much of anything. So same with us with China. And that, that wake up call in 2018 was good for Australian exporters. It's got us looking outside around the world and everyone's benefiting from that. And markets sort of broadly sideways in April, March had been a positive month, albeit that's because the conflict in Ukraine sort of sparked at the very end of February, which saw markets sell off into the start of March. So then they sort of rebounded over the course of the month. April was yep. sort of up and down a little bit, but largely sideways up a little bit for the month so far to the for the to the twenty first. Yes, I think um, it's a bit like uh, we we had the markets, the stock markets have changed in the last year. This time last year was the peak of the speculative boom, the peak of Bitcoin, the peak of Robinhood, the peak the of SPACs. all of those uh, the yeah. SPACs and the NFTs. They peaked in in. Uh, you know, all the GameStop stuff, that was the first quarter of last year, April last year, the Robin Hood float, um, the, uh, the, the, uh, all of those um, weird cryptos and the SPACs, that all peaked last year, about this time last year. There was another mini peak in November as well. Uh, you know, Tesla peaks and all those things peaked. Uh, that's now, stock markets in America are still flattish from last year, which is good, but it's changed in shape. The speculative, the speculative angle is off. You know, you've got Apple now trading on PEs of 20s, Microsoft trading on PEs yeah. of 20, Amazon's 30s, Facebook's now well, We're probably 20s. starting to see the, the even, even amongst the fangs, the tech stocks get divided with the, you know, the cash cows, as you described, Apple, probably Google, Microsoft, and then Netflix, as an example, I think its subscriber base went down by a couple of hundred thousand for the first time ever this week in their yes. latest announcement. Yep. The market's definitely separating them, Facebook, let's say, from, from some of the others based on right. their revenue, their profitability. So I think um, the market, uh, short of a big collapse, and one's going to occur, no doubt about that, because they, they always do. Um, people ask me, are the shares going to go up or down? I say, well, they're going to go up, they're going to go down, they get up. That's, that's what they do. So uh, there's going to be a crash and there's going to be 10 more crashes in my lifetime. So get over it. In terms of the shape of the market, I, I can liken it to uh, 99, 2000. We had the tech wreck in 2001 too, and that, that's on the way mm. sometime in the future. But there's been a, it's a rotation at the top. So we, we haven't got the big kick in the guts yet, but it, it will occur from probably out of the blue, probably rate hikes in the US more aggressive than we think. Uh, plus some geopolitical shocks down the track, don't know. But we're in a stage now where share markets have been flat. There have been uh, global share markets were down 2 or 3% in the first quarter of, la of this year. Australia was up a fraction or dead flat because we've got the miners contributing, which is good. Brazil, a lot of the emerging markets are up this year because of their commodities exports, which are good. But Europe's down you know, half a dozen percent. US is down 3 or 4 or 5%. Um, the speculative end has been taken off. So if you think about the top of the dot com, the whole, the whole top of the last end of the 90s, the whole US market was trading on a price earnings ratio of 40 plus. Now it's 20, 21. So it's less speculative. So the big apples and Microsofts are trading on price earnings ratios of 20s, maybe 30. Even Amazon is down to about 40 off the 500s. Tesla is at still 200, but that's a, that's, that's a, a pure bubble stock, Tesla. It's profitable barely, um, not paying a dividend. Of There's all a lot of top, subsidies baked into their profitability. Of all the top 10 stocks in the US, only two are paying dividends, mm. Apple and Microsoft. Uh, now Berkshire Hathaway never has, never will. But all the other ones are the Teslas, the NVIDIAs, the, um, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Metas. So they're all not paying dividends, may well never do. So that's still got a speculative edge to it. Even though the earnings engine of Amazon is very strong, the earnings engine of, of, of uh, Microsoft and Apple are extremely strong. So what happened in Netflix is it's a bit like Facebook last a couple of years ago. Facebook has been growing at you know, 20, 30, 40% revenue subscriber profit base uh, for years. All of a sudden, it's, the, the world has only got 7.5 billion people on it and that there's only a certain number of smartphones you can sell to 7.5 billion people. And therefore, the apples are now mature, aging giants. They're no longer speculative um, dot-com stocks. Well, they're uh, trying to Microsoft. move the revenue base from probably the hardware to the subscription-based model on their Apple Music, right. the cloud, the gaming, etc. 
So Netflix was on a, on a trajectory like this. All of a sudden, it said, a bit like Facebook. You know, all of a sudden, it said Facebook two months ago said, "Oh, look, we're not going. You know, we're going to plateau." Which is every company plateaus. Happened to hit those. So Netflix went. I think this time last year, it was trading at about six hundred odd dollars a share. Got up to about nearly seven hundred dollars in April, in August, uh, September, October, November last year, and it was like six hundred dollars, five hundred dollars a share last week. Now it's dropped to about. $250 a share, which is what it was, say, 2018, it was the same price. And it's still not making, it won't pay dividends for years and years, if ever. It's it's profitable, sort of. It's trading a price earnings ratio now, uh, much lower than it was. Even Facebook Meta is on a price earnings ratio of about 20, which you've got to say is not bad for a mature aging company. Mm. Um, so they're, they're not dot-com type valuations still, um, the market is more reasonable now than it was in um, in the end of 1999, uh, 2000. It doesn't mean it won't collapse when a shock occurs, but that rotation is already occurring and largely occurred out of the speculative end to the revenue generating end. I was going to say, yeah, I think there's been a big hard line drawn between those companies that are non-profitable and don't have a runway to be profitable in the next 24, 36 months and therefore constantly need capital. And if the capital is going to be a lot more expensive now, um, than it was a year or two ago, then suddenly the market's lot, a lot less in love with those stories than it was even six or 12 months ago. That's right. So this, this new term called long duration stocks now, you know, I'd never heard of that term, but it was, it's become fashionable over the last year. The idea is that long duration stocks mean the, uh, stocks where the cash flow to investors from dividends is a long way away. Like a long duration bond is that the, the maturity is a long way away. So the cash flow from dividends from Amazon Bezos has always said, now he's out of the game, but he's always said, he founded the company 25 years ago, he said, I will never pay a dividend because I can always reinvest it more profitably in my hands rather than your hands. Warren Buffett said the same thing for 60 years. He will never pay a dividend because they can make a return on capital higher than you can in a dividend. So they won't ever pay a dividend. Now, now Bezos is out of the game. Uh, Apple is now paying dividends. Microsoft's paying dividends. Most likely Facebook. Facebook's been profitable since day one. Uh, it's not on the same sort of, almost straight line trajectory at the moment. It's a mature company and most likely it'll pay dividends. So the the difference with um, the dot-com era is these are real revenue generating, profit generating companies, including Amazon and, Apple and Facebooks and Apples, um, but they will start to pay dividends. So the long duration stocks are the ones that will never pay dividend, like the afterpays, um, which is a good story for Australian shareholders now that they own Square or Block. Um, those are coming at a lot of pressure because the higher cost of capital, the higher cost of debt, the higher cost of equity means that they, those long duration stocks with a long way to getting a dividend are being hammered. That started this time last year and that's halfway out of the system now. There's still some left. It's, it's, a, it's a natural more. rationalization uh, yeah. of the market which is, there. Which is, which is a good thing. Yeah, correct. Um, do you mind, I might just take a quite tangent while we're talking companies and talking tech companies to talk about LinkedIn and what's been going on in the battle for control of LinkedIn in the last uh, 10 days or Twitter. so. Twitter. Sorry, Twitter, apologies. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So um, Elon Musk has made a play for Twitter. He sort of got his um, shareholding to 9%, pushing it up, trying to push it towards 15%, potentially get a board seat, all those things, question marks over what his goals are for for Twitter, uh, LinkedIn being owned by Microsoft, of course. Um, and the Twitter defense of they've gone for the poison pill, uh, an old favorite, but uh, uh, not seen for a, a decade or two. Do you mind sharing with us, if possible, um, a, a brief summary of what the, how the poison pill defense plays out? Well, there, there's different sorts of poison pills. Poison pills uh, have been used for decades, uh, mainly in America, to ward off takeovers. Um, it became very popular in the 80s and again in the dot-com boom. Um, so a company can, and off, often a poison pill is the ability to issue billions of shares to water down the inquirer. It's diluted. You, you spend the, ne the next 10 years in court as to whether it's legal or whether it's abuse of minorities. So lawyers love these things and lawyers design them so they can spend years in court so they can get buy boats and beach houses for the lawyers. Um, so the uh, Musk has had made a bid for Twitter. Twitter is, is his major mouthpiece. He moves markets on Twitter. So he said, I can own this thing. Mm. Um, why he did it? I don't know. Um, Twitter is interesting because for particularly Australian shareholders who had Afterpay, 
and sold out at the top of the boom. After pay, every time you open the books of update, it loses more money. It'll never make a dollar. It's a complete waste of space. But if you had share, shares in Afterpay, fantastic, and you sold out, which is good. Unfortunately, the the, uh, the profit's down even more, and you've got shares in Square, which changed its name to Block to try and get out of the Square problems. Jack Dorsey, the, the common link of this is Jack Dorsey. Jack Dorsey, who is a genius, he invented of Twitter. Square, invented Twitter. One of the he's now effectively left Twitter because uh, he can't run two big companies globally, so he's he sort of stepped off from Twitter. And it's it's not leaderless, but it is quite different now. Jack Dorsey spends his life complaining about Twitter, so probably um, it's lost Elon its Musk has said, I can I can actually lead Twitter into a better life, and he he may well he may well be able to do that. So Jack Dorsey is now running Square or Block, which is now twenty percent owned by Afterpay shareholders. So it's got a big link to Australia. Um, so what? Twitter's done is it has revived an old plan which basically says we will issue shares to the existing shareholders to water down um, the, the, the power of the takeover. Whether it'll work, don't know, don't care. Twitter's one of those things, it's, 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 um, it's profitable occasionally. It's, it's a company um, that hasn't really grown significantly, given everything what's happened around it in the the social media space, the technology space hasn't really grown in capital value substantially like its peers over the last decade, hasn't probably evolved significantly over the, perhaps, it, it, perhaps that's just uh, symptomatic of Jack Dorsey's sort of passion going elsewhere and it's sort of stagnated. I think, yes, I don't know. It was, it's a bit like, I, 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 I don't, I'm not on any social. So I've got to admit here, I'm not a social animal. And I Well, I do really have a LinkedIn uh, request to connect with you that's been left open for about five years now i just thought it was i don't even know how to answer the request because i got to log in and i've lost my password so i'm not in on any social at all and i do have an old linkedin which i think somebody put up years ago um so don't try and link me uh, i find nowadays you're in a meeting with somebody you never met before and never met again by the time they get to the lift you got a request for, for to be your best friend for life it just doesn't yeah. make any sense to me anyway so i ignore all that stuff but i i like and, Twitter, and twitter's a great mouthpiece for politicians and and um a non-commercial world to get news out. Nothing wrong with that. Um, I, th I liken it to like a, a Wikipedia. It's like a service uh, to provide information and rubbish, you know, of, of very it's important. It's a modern day world. town crier. It's a town crier, uh, but it's full of stuff as well. It's full in stuff, some, some, you know, one percent of it's good news. The rest of it's fluff. So, uh, so I'm being a bit unfair to, to, to Wikipedia in that sense, but I don't, I don't see it as a great revenue model and profit model, and it certainly hasn't been exploited and grown, uh, and maybe that's what uh, uh, Musk thinks he can do. Meanwhile, you've got the TikToks of the world who've taken over sort of the Facebooks of the world, so that, that's moving. You can't, you can't be an incumbent forever. You'll be overtaken by the next round, and the next round will be three or four other things in my lifetime and the Twitters and Facebook will come and go, and it'll be the next one we don't even know about now. Um, so I don't have any shares in, in Twitter or any of those things, and I'm just watching from the sidelines as to a, a corporate play as to how you try and ward off a, an aggressive. Musk may will be good, and most likely the poison pills um, worked as well as they did 20, 30 years ago, and that is enrich the lawyers and not shareholders. Mm. Um, so we'll we'll watch the courts for the next few years and see what happens. And I might round us out back by in relation to one of your comments before um, rising inflation, rising interest rates. We're definitely obviously in a, a rising interest rate environment. Um, where do you feel that the best place to be positioned is in a rising interest rate environment? You know, is it is okay. it run for the hills and and load up in cash? We don't want long uh, okay. bonds. Shares might be challenged. It's sort of pick the pick the least favourite. We are in the exactly we're doing right that that right now with the April meeting. I think next week with the asset allocation for portfolios and what are we doing? The there's a few principles. One is that by and large shares as a group, there's good bits and bad bits, but as shares as a group have and most likely always will be in a fairly good place for money in rising interest rates and rising inflation, except high inflation. High inflation is sort of consistent, you know, high single digits or double digit inflation. That for a whole lot of reasons is not good for share prices or revenues or profits or dividends for shares, so for shareholders. So 
rising, albeit from a low base, is has, has been a very good place for shareholders in industrial revenue-based companies for many, many cycles, and this one again. So I can see as a place to be, a broad asset allocation, shares, cash flow generating shares are a good place to be because they're good natural inflation hedges and interest rate hedges. So nothing wrong with that. Bonds, uh, and the same goes for commercial property. Um, housing is born bubble like it's far more debt ridden and there's lots of sectors that are going to be hit by it when that, when that uh, unravels. But commercial property, cash flow generating commercial properties, industrial property, retail less so, but, industri but commercial property as a group has tended to work well in rising inflation environments to pass on interest rate rises yeah. and pass on inflation to a point. And when you get to high inflation, they get clobbered. That's as a group, real estate is not a bad place to be with moderate, slow rising inflation and interest rates, shares, commercial property, real estate in general, because they are real assets. They can pass on inflation and they do well in rising rate environments, except when you get to high inflation, positionally like the seventies. Now, the, the defensive, the so-called defensive asset classes, um, cash or floating rates is actually not a bad place to be because as cash rates rise from 0, 1, 2, 3%, you're going to get 0, 1, 2, 3% on your money, which is not a bad place to be. So rising rate environments, rising inflation environments, um, most of our defensive side of portfolios is in floating rate, high grade floating rate securities, short term corporate debt, high grade investment grade, which rise, their, 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 their yields are based on bank bills plus X, you know, 1%, 2%. So that return will increase progressively as cash rates increase. The reverse is true for government bonds. When government bonds rates rise, the bond capital values fall. Yeah. So, so in the last quarter, duration, government bonds, the, the last I quarter, we have, we have only a very tiny proportion, very small proportion. Most uh, pension funds in the world are stacked full of government bonds and corporate bonds. The bond market, globally and in Australia had the worst quarter in the March quarter 2022 was the worst quarter for Australian government bonds since Australia defaulted in middle of 1931. Yeah. Far worse than the 1994 bond crash. Our quarter for government bonds in Australia, Commonwealth government bonds in Australia, posted about minus 6% return, which is the worst return for government bonds in a quarter since June quarter 1931. And I wrote about that in the, in the report. Globally, it's been the worst reporter since about the end of 1981, when rates went to 18% to kill inflation in the, out of the, the Volcker recessions in the US. So you've got to ask, which, which is one of the exercises we're doing this week is, one, one view says, unless you have to regulate, unless you have a regulatory mandate to own government bonds, which a lot of you know, life companies, banks do, mm. there's no reason why you would be in government bonds. That's a base case given that we know rates are going to rise over the next three, 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 four, five years. Government bonds are going to go through a bear market, which will last 20 or 30 years, probably, like late 40s to 1979, like 1900, 1921. It'll be a long bear market in bonds. So unless you have to regulatory hold these things, then don't hold them. The other point of view is to say that if we have a big recession, like we will in China, we will in Europe, may well be in Australia and most likely US, Australia's got more commodities-based revenues in it, but... Europe's going to be in recession, if not already. Um, US may be, certainly China, maybe Japan. Bonds are not bad because remember in the 2020 recession, the COVID recession, bond yields fell to about 50 basis points in Australia mm -hmm. and the US. They're now 200 plus basis points, 300 basis points. So you've got quite a scope now for bond yields to collapse in a recession. Have the potential for them to contract once again. Which gives you capital gains. So we've, got, yeah. we've now got a buffer in there. You know, in Australia, 10-year bonds are paying 3%, which means... They went down to 60 points in 2020. That means there's a capital gain of 10% on your bond portfolio. So there's still a case, a bare case to say that bonds are still useful. Fixed rate bonds are still useful as a buffer against share sell-offs in a, in a slowdown scare, like a recession scare, mm -hmm. like 2020. It's um, the most likely case is for short of, um, with the exception of shocks like that, which we'll get from time to time, the medium term view would say in the medium term, you really don't want to be in long-term fixed rate government bonds. We've got high grade corporate bond. Most of our bond portfolio is in corporate bonds and most of our defensive portfolio is not in bonds at all. It's in high grade floating rate, which rise as inflation rises and cash rates rise. So 
that's the positioning we're going to debate next week. And we'll come out and talk to you about, uh, we'll report on that at the end of April, early May, about what we're doing in portfolios. Well, we look forward to that next quarterly report, early May. Yep. And uh, I'm looking forward to catching up to speak about it soon after that. Thank you very much, Brilliant. as always, Ashley. Entertaining. Brilliant. Stay away from those poison pills. <laughs> Bye, all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.